It's a cesspool of corruption and crime, but somehow I like Night City, even while simultaneously loathing it for the dystopian meat grinder it is. With its garish fashions, its 80s retro future, the boxy cars and clunky computer tech, for someone that grew up in the era of Blade Runner and Neuromancer, it's almost like going home. And of course, the evil megacorporations, these corrupt conglomerates doing nefarious things with impunity is a staple of the genre, and cyberpunk in general is often a scathing critique of the excesses of our own society, to the point that I've had quite a few discussions over the years with self-described Marxists exploring its depiction of late-stage capitalism and what it means in the broader socioeconomic context. But what does late-stage capitalism even mean? And is the evil megacorp operating as a state unto itself capitalist at all? It's going to take me a few points to answer that. Giant monopoly corporations are a staple of cyberpunk. In the case of CDPR's game, it's best embodied in the Arasaka Corporation, a grand example of the ghost of 1980s Japanese success before the easy money financialization bubble burst. These kinds of fictional megacorporations embody all the worst excesses of capitalism and, when done well, are an excellent critique of commercialization and corporate greed. But they're also caricatures that leave out some important details. So, first thing, what is capitalism? By objective metrics, this is capitalism. This near-vertical spike in per-person GDP, average individual purchasing power, standard of living. This is the closest thing we have to a measurement of capitalism's macro-level effect, this explosion of wealth and productivity. But how does it work? A Marxist will tell you it's a system of exploitation in which the owners of capital steal the labor of the working class. Ask a self-identifying capitalist and they'll tell you that private property and free markets drive innovation and lead to an improved standard of living for everyone. But both usually leave out the key point. Capitalism is a system of market dependence. It makes people work and compete for money. It drives innovation because that market dependence incentivizes specialization and efficiency through constant competition. It's exploitive in the sense that you can't opt out and grow turnips on your land for subsistence. You have to exchange something for currency in order to buy essentials and, importantly, keep the government at bay. For most people, what they have to exchange is their labor. If the worker tries to opt out and subsistence farm, the government will come and shut them down. Overdue taxes, zoning violations, they'll find something. You know the drill. So with that in mind, capitalism requires government to enforce not just property rights, but market dependence. Without that, you can have a free market, but we've had that for thousands of years in various forms and places without having capitalism and that rapid rise of living standards that comes with it. Where this comes in here is that Cyberpunk 2077, like many cyberpunk stories, is set in a failed state, a broken nation after ecological disaster, civil war, or some other calamity. And where governmental institutions leave a partial vacuum, that void is filled by greedy, monstrous corporations and crime syndicates. But I repeat myself. Having spent my share of time in universities, I've known a few Marxists who really latch on to cyberpunk, both how it's a representation of the alienation of citizens, of workers, atomizing society into a collection of lost individuals separated by a wall of invasive technology, and, on a more basic level, unchecked capitalism growing like a cancer in the absence of a functioning government, exploiting without limit the people and environment alike. But as I've already hinted at, there is a false dichotomy here. The basic thing we have to keep in mind is that every organization, whether a corporation, a government, or a crime syndicate, is just a tool for the people that run it. And it's not a controversial statement to say that people that run these kinds of organizations are generally motivated by money and power. Put another way, a corporation is just a business given legal status by the government, and the government is just a corporation that can force you to buy its services. Exploitation and oppression are rooted in power disparities, which corporations and government both, to varying extents, codify, organize, and exploit for the gain of the people controlling them. The essence, the punk of cyberpunk, is in taking the technology of the powerful, the technology they use to exert their power, 
and turning it against them, using it to subvert those power structures. It's more relevant today than ever, with the twin powers of big business and big government on the one hand, making it increasingly necessary to use technologies like electronic banking and up-to-date mobile phones in daily life while simultaneously imposing ever tighter controls on how individuals can use that technology to spread dissenting ideas for commerce outside the approved and taxable confines, and increasingly to simply not have your location data or online browsing habits and snare you in criminal proceedings. The cyberpunk isn't simply a rebel rejecting the technological world, but an apostate, fully embracing the potential of the technology, immersed in the technical details and how it fits into the wider social structure, but rejecting the ideology of it, the ideology of the ruling elites and the ends they use the technology for. And this is where a lot of the criticism and analysis falls short. In all these discussions of cyberpunk's anti-capitalist themes and as a broader critique of late-stage capitalism, there is usually an assumption that some form of Marxist-derived socialism is what post-capitalism looks like, that some collective manifestation of the downtrodden, commodified technoproles must push back against the corporate overlords and seize the means of production for a more equitable post-capitalist world. When I think of it in that light, Cyberpunk is almost 21st century capitalism seen through a 19th century socialist eyes. And the idea of socialism as a transitional period is partly the result of 19th century thinkers not being able to visualize how a post-capitalist economy would work because the technology of the time simply didn't allow for it. To put it in perspective, imagine a bunch of serfs working on a baron's land. One of these serfs, we'll call him Karl, recognizes that feudalism is extracting their labor for the benefit of the baron, but that other forms of socioeconomic organization are possible, forms that don't force the many to toil in the fields while a few enjoy wealth and comfort. He starts talking, because he's an illiterate serf and he can't write, and eventually convinces the others to throw down their plows, seize the baron's lands, and usher in the new post-feudal society. Only, they don't have the technological base for industrial production, and they have no concept of capital that isn't tied to land. The best they can do is kick the baron out of his manor and continue to farm the land as a cooperative. And naturally, someone needs to take on the managerial task that the baron used to do and engage in negotiations with the neighboring barons who still control their estates. I just described the plot of Animal Farm, but you get the point. It's not post-feudalism, it's just feudalism with new bosses and ideological cover to hide that fact. Maybe they'll say it's a transitional stage, but they have no coherent idea what they're transitioning into or how to get there. And in the meantime, the old Baron's Manor is pretty comfortable. This is what all the socialist states of the last century have been. Post-capitalism isn't the workers seizing the means of production, taking over factories and turning them into collectives. Post-capitalism is decentralized production, vastly reducing the need for big factories, warehouses, complex supply chains, and the wealth-collecting apparatus that comes with all of it. We're just starting to feel the leading edge of that. We no longer need television networks or newspapers to spread information. With additive manufacturing technology, we don't need sprawling factory complexes to produce manufactured goods, and this technology is steadily becoming better and more affordable. From farming to electrical power, it's becoming easier to do it in decentralized ways that undermine the current top-down, consolidated megacorporation way of organizing a technological society. Late-stage capitalism isn't the dying gasp of this system before the inevitable rise of communism, but rather the desperate attempt to stifle that decentralizing, to force new technologies into the top-down model that can be licensed, taxed, regulated, or outright banned. It's a convergence of corporations and governments desperately trying to shore up their own monopolies on control, whether economic or political. Cyberpunk shows us this union of capital and government trying to keep people locked into their system, that the two are not opposing or balancing forces, but different masks of the same power disparity. Our thinking is still rooted in 20th century experience and essentially 19th century theory. If we're going to be looking at the past to understand the retro future and perhaps our own, we should go all the way back to 1600 with the founding of the East India Company. The East India Company began as a joint stock company, what we would recognize as a publicly traded corporation. Queen Elizabeth granted them a charter for a monopoly on trade from the East Indies into the British Isles. They went, set up trading posts, and money flowed into their pockets. The East India Company also raised its own army to protect its facilities and routes. 
In 1757, this army, along with a heaping helping of bribery, defeated the Bengali prince and forced him to grant terms that included monopoly trade and tax powers. At this point, the East India Company starts to look like a government. It extracts taxes, and if you stand up to it, the army comes after you. Incidentally, this is about where the Hindi word loot entered the English language. In 1773, the company almost went broke due to a famine crushing exports, but being too big to fail, they were bailed out. After which they acted as a sort of agent of the crown, with more government regulation, but still the company was functioning as the government of India. Until their army of Indian soldiers rebelled in 1857, and in 1859, Queen Victoria more or less nationalized the company. Change the setting to a neon megacity and you've got the start of some good cyberpunk there. And it illustrates that governments and corporations are symbiotic, even faces of the same thing. They don't counterbalance each other. The real problem is the concentration of power anywhere. A great strength of cyberpunk is that its stories separate technology itself from the socioeconomic structures that created it and try to control it. Cyberpunk 2077 captures that with its story of V, a cast-off of society fighting to survive. V's mind is literally being consumed by technology, reprogrammed as the story progresses. It's a great metaphor of the individual standing against an oppressive and all-consuming system. A system that's not only pushing down from outside, but has invaded our bodies and our minds. But at the same time, there's a collectivist fatalism to it. There's no ending where V has Silverhand's construct removed and lives a long, happy life. No ending where the Arasaka Corporation is brought down and its executives pay for their many crimes. No victorious ending. The best outcomes are the ones where V makes the most of the time left, spending it with friends or pulling off an epic heist. The proud individual burning brightly but briefly before the inevitable technologically inflicted end. The doomed individualist washed away by a collectivist tide. The only chance for survival that the game offers is to become part of a digital collective. A disembodied consciousness blended with something else, part of something else, contributing but no longer distinct. They will be integrated with me. Through me, they gain the chance to become part of something greater. To survive at all requires a choice between being subsumed in Alt's collective mind or imprisoned in Arasaka's trapped in the corporate structure of late-stage capitalism, or lost in an undefined collective existing in the shadows of that world. If we look at cyberpunk as a critique of capitalism, we must also critique its lack of a post-capitalist option. As if they could hope for anything better. So what would a post-capitalist economy look like? I can't describe it in detail, partly because it's decentralized by nature and will have a lot of variation, local flavor, and experimentation. We can't foresee all the twists and turns it would take as it develops, but we can infer some basic traits. First, in order to not be capitalist, it would have to curtail market dependency. This doesn't necessarily mean that there are no markets or profit motives or money. It just means that people have options for self-sufficiency or closed communities without dropping out of wider society. We've already mentioned decentralizing technology. 3D printers, home-based power, whether solar, geothermal, small community, nuclear, anything that moves away from big grids owned by heavily regulated utility companies. It would require sound currency. Today, our money is created by governments. It's valuable because they say it is, and they can manipulate markets by making more of it and distributing it to whom they choose. A true free market isn't possible when the state makes itself a party to all transactions and manipulates the medium of exchange. It also requires limited government. One can't reduce corruption by adding more mass to government in the hope of counterbalancing corporations. Doing so just increases the aggregate mass of corruption because in the end, they're closely entwined structures directed by the same people. But there has to be some structure for property rights in complex industry. We'll still need to mine minerals, manufacture microprocessors, and do countless other things that don't scale down very well to an individual level. I'm deliberately vague here because a post-capitalist economy is a new thing. It's not fully formed and there will be some curves and dead ends on the way. We'll have to try things and some of them won't work very well. I don't have all those answers and I wouldn't trust anyone who says they do. Right now we're trying to put the puzzle together without all the pieces, but I think we've had a fleeting glimpse at the box art to guide us. 
Some are probably disappointed that I'm not going full ANCAP here. I'm just looking at the minimal traits of a post-capitalist economy that still has high technology and some level of innovation. Its governing structure is a more specific issue and it could go several different ways. All we can say for certain is that it wouldn't be a centralized system of sprawling factories and collective farms, all managed by some oppressive entity owning all of it, whether the state or a corporation acting as a state in all but name. That's the dead-end future. Cyberpunk shows us what that future, that wrong turn, might look like. A world of proprietary body implants, virtual world distractions to bleed off discontent, crowded cities and debt peonage, godlike wealth and power existing beside crushing poverty. It shows us where that road goes, and it warns us to take a different turn. The catch is, we'll have to make our own road to go a different way. All right, someone said marauds. Who was it?